Welcome to Happily Ever After is just the beginning. Keeping your relationship not just together, but happy, and we mean truly happy, is part art and part science. You've come to the right place. Here's your host, Leslie Dorries. Have you ever caught yourself saying, my marriage is important, but... Well, many years ago, I had a client who said that to me. His his statement to me was, my marriage is important, but... And then he proceeded to tell me why that wasn't true. He gave me all the excuses of, well, I'm busy at work, and we have to take care of the dog, and I travel, and all these other excuses for why he wasn't making his marriage a priority. And by the way, I get it. I just celebrated my 30th wedding anniversary. I have two children who are now grown into adults. I know how easy it is for the squeaky wheel to get attention. And if your relationship is okay, it's not squeaking like your boss or your kids or the dog. I also know how easy it is to make assumptions about the person you've been living with for years and to fall into bad relationship habits. That's what happens to most couples. But to be honest, it does not have to happen to you. I've always been a proponent of being intentional in your relationship. Um, You most likely, most of us have some kind of plan, maybe it's just sketchy, maybe it's well thought out about where we want our career to go, but my guess is you've probably never made a plan for your relationship. And that might even seem like an odd thing to do. I mean, you're in love, right? What more do you need? Well, to help me explain why you might want to open yourself up to the idea of a plan or at least intentionality, especially if you want your relationship to be fulfilling over the long term, I'm joined by international speaker, author, and thought leader, Michael J. Russer. Michael, thank you so much for being on. I'm so glad to have you. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, and it's interesting because I came across your pre, uh your presentation on the limitless joy of never fully knowing your significant other. And for me, I saw that and I went, oh, I've I've got to listen to this. This is fantastic. But I know for other people, that would send them into a state of complete and utter fear and shock. It's like, what do you mean we can't know our partner, really know our partner? Right. Yeah, (laughs) I know. That's scary. Uh, (laughs) It is scary, and it's thrilling at the same time. You know, one of my favorite sayings is is that most people prefer the certainty of their misery than rather than risk the risk the misery that can come with uncertainty. We avoid uncertainty, which is hardwired into us. So when you when you accept the possibility that you don't know your partner and will never completely know them, which for me and my partner is like the most thrilling and exhilarating uh, process, uh, you it, it, it can bring in fears of, well, geez, what if I discover something about them I don't mm-hmm. like or vice versa? And well, <laughs> what happens then? And, you know, and so it it is because of that, it that, that's like one of the first steps going down the path of settling and and mm-hmm. and frustration and just that that kind of that gauzy feel of, well, yeah, it's OK, but, you know, just like you said in the beginning. Well, it's interesting because it's one of those things that I can pretty much guarantee that you're going to learn something about your partner that you may not like. (laughs) And It was funny because years ago I had a client who she and her husband were in, and I said, said, what is it that you'd really like to accomplish? And she says, well, I just want to know that my partner's never going to hurt me. And I just (laughs) went, okay, we're done because I can guarantee your partner is going to hurt you. Now, the question is is whether or not they do it intentionally. But it was just like, well, okay, we're done because. (laughs) Get a divorce. There you go. He won't hurt you anymore. Uh, you right. know, I mean, it just for crying out loud. Yeah, I, I know. Well, you know, if I could address that, because that is really the crux of um, a lot of relationships is the fear of, of being hurt, which is really 
uh, the fear of rejection or abandonment. And if you peel away all the layers of the onion, uh, you find that that goes down to our very survival instinct because it, mm-hmm. in our ancient DNA, being abandoned or rejected by the tribe meant you have about 24 hours to live. And uh, and <laughs> right. we still have that wiring in us. And our ego can't tell the difference between uh, a physical threat, which at one uh-huh. point in our history, that it actually was a physical threat, versus an emotional uh, uh, experience. And it collapses that notion, and we have the same physiological uh, response to it as if our very life would be threatened. And so Absolutely. if I can... If I can speak to that, because I, what I do is I, I give people a safety net uh, of sorts, and it's merely a, a worldview or what I call a context. Now, as you probably know, there are no worldviews that are absolutely true. There, there's only some that are more empowering than others. And I wrote an article uh, probably a couple years ago called There's No Such Thing as a Broken Heart. And, oh, you wouldn't believe, well, yeah, you would believe, Leslie. <laughs> I probably would believe it, you yeah. You would believe, but the, 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 the angst people and almost anger in defending their right to be miserable. And I and said, no, my heart does hurt. I can feel it. And, you know, what are you talking about? And on and on and on. And, and you know, so uh, the, the context I talk about is, is the, the alternative t- context I talk about, and something that my partner and I ascribe to, is that we are not our ego, our false self. Uh, we, uh, we are our, our heart, metaphorically speaking, uh, in, mm-hmm. tr- in the sense that it is our true essence. And the heart never, ever, ever can be hurt, is never longing, is never jealous, is <laughs> never needy, is, uh, is always there to, to give and receive unconditional love I- invariably. And all we end up doing is putting up these barriers and, and, and sheets of armor to block that. And okay, so Michael, can I, I ask you a question? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What world do you live in? What world do I live in? <laughs> Yeah, because I'm sure people are like going, okay, yeah, that's what, yeah, what planet are you from? What world do you live in where hearts can't be hurt? Because, I mean, I know what you're saying. I mean, people, yeah. people will say that. And the thing I tell people is you have to want a relationship. You can't need one because once exactly. you need one, you're in trouble. You're already in trouble. Exactly. So, yeah, n- need, yeah need comes from fear. You know, and a mm-hmm. want is aspirational. And so, yeah, no, I'm very much from this planet. And I, um, I use this in my, own, in my own relationship as well as my partner does. I, uh, in fact, I wrote about a time when we, my partner and I are always talking, always, always, always talking about, about deep stuff. And one night, uh, we, we, after going out dancing, we go out dancing every Friday night, uh, sometimes Saturday night, too, and we went out for dancing. She comes back, and or we come back, and she's just out of the blue. She'll sometimes say these things, and she says, you know, when I first met you, uh, oh, she says, uh, you know, y- you look so handsome, and your face is so, I said, well, thank you. She says, I didn't always think that. Oh. <laughs> nice. Okay, thanks, hun. Oh, oh, okay. And then I, I, uh, my ego was immediately going, ow, ow, mm-hmm. ow, 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 you know, and, and yet I had that context, and as a result, I was able to, uh, you know, observe it happening. You know, being the observer is a big part of this. Uh, mm-hmm. Observe it happening. Yeah, I felt it. I actually, my ego felt it, and it actually registered in my body. And uh, and within an hour, it was gone. Mm-hmm. And 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 the thing is, is I would much rather. Uh, I'd much rather have her be authentic with her communications than trying to worry about whatever feelings she might hurt of mine, because those feelings is strictly the ego uh, talking again, you know? Right, and I'm sure she didn't say it to you specifically to hurt your feelings. She was- no, she didn't. But even if she yeah. did, let's, let's, let's take the worst case. Let's say okay. she did, and she just had a rotten day, you know, blah, 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 and, you know, and this. And, or I come home and one time and she says, you know what, we're done. And there was a time when I thought that was going to actually happen. Uh-huh. And 
for someone in my situation, uh, I'm a uh, I'm a double cancer survivor with two ongoing forms of cancer. Uh, I started I just had just started a whole new career about you know helping people with their relationships, and. Uh, I had so much uncertainty, so much uh, like, oh, my God. Yet, because of that context, which, again, I'm not saying is true. I'm just saying it's Mm -hmm. more empowering, right? And there's a distinction. Because people want, well, what's true? Well, you're going to die. That's true. (laughs) Pretty much that's it. That's it, pretty much. Everything else is up in the air, and and uh, not even our our most cherished scientific theories are absolutely true. They're always going to be subsumed by some a more accurate picture, and the uh-huh. same thing about relationships. So this isn't true, but neither is that your heart gets broken. True, but I can tell you which one is far more empowering. In uh-huh. any case, going going back to that story, I I um, I. I was able to, because I I ascribed to that context, I was able to really wrap her in the love of my heart and wish the very, very best for her, even if that meant saying goodbye to her and which is not something i wanted to do but i sure. was not i i wasn't going to hold on to her from a standpoint of need because as you just indicated you've already lost the moment mm-hmm. you're needy you've lost mm-hmm. so you were talking about needing versus wanting and we're talking about choosing um, a different way of interpreting something in a, a more empowering way so mm-hmm. Which makes sense to me, but why do you think it's so difficult for most couples to have both lasting and fulfilling relationships? Not or, yeah. but both and. Both, both, yeah. Well, how about this? How about having a relationship where the honeymoon period, as wonderful as it was, is actually the low point in your fulfillment, which is the case for my partner and I. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to be celebrating our fourth year coming up in the fall. It just keeps getting better and better and better, which is unbelievable because the honeymoon period was out of the world. It was world. pretty terrific, right. Mm-hmm. I, it was, well, you, you saw the TEDx talk. You saw I just, did. I mean, mm-hmm. it was beyond anything. <laughs> Had ever ever had before, and it has since uh, actually made uh, made that uh, our relationship now is, uh, is made that look like a shadow of what we have now. But th- I think there, there's a couple of things that go on here. Uh, the first is is that um, that uh, getting back to the whole reason you know the not knowing your your, your partner. Okay, mm-hmm. so you uh, human beings tend to want to label everything because that's that that need for certainty. Labeling gives you a mental construct of who this person is or what that thing is or whatever situation and it gives right. it us simplifies this, it simplifies our world if we had to try to figure out everything all the time we would never get anything done exactly so th- there is a use for that but when it comes to relationships it is actually deleterious because in the labeling you essentially have only allowed yourself to see the tip of the iceberg beneath the surface is an infinite possibility uh, and, and expansiveness of who that person really is beyond even what they may know. What we've discovered in our relationship is that things are coming out in each other that we didn't know about ourselves. Well, that's we an interesting that point. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point because relationships, it's what you bring what I bring, and then what we create together. And all of that is in flux. All of that changes. And, Mm. you know, I tell people that, thank goodness, that we actually do get something other than just wrinkles and gray hair when we get older. (laughs) We're frequently, we're much more open to exploring who we are as people. um, And, or we just come across a new idea because we've been on the planet for a long enough period of time. And that can be very threatening to mm-hmm. our partner if they're not actually doing the same thing. It's like, no, 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 you're supposed to be over here in this little box where yeah. I know where to find you. And no like, surprises. What's the, what's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, what's, what's the old joke that um, men think that their women will never change and women think – 
you know, men men don't want the women to change, and women want the men to change. And it's like, okay. well, I, no, that doesn't I, work very well. I actually wrote an article calling uh, "Prayers at the Altar." That uh, you know, men it, it basically iterated just what you said. You know, when when a man and woman get married, he secretly just before they say "I do," he's secretly issuing an, uh, a prayer saying, "Please God, please do not let her change." Uh-huh. She's hot, she's wonderful, and I just, oh God, please don't let her change. And she's saying, okay, okay, he's, you know, he's good, he's good, but... He's good, but he could be better. Thing, there could be, could be better, and, and they both end up being disappointed. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really interesting where, I, you know, it starts out, first of all, being really clear about who you want to share your life with, but that's an entirely different conversation Ooh, and probably another yeah, show. Is. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and so um, uh, assuming that that has been in place, okay, assuming that there is that that level of compatibility, then the way to to start out the relationship, um, or from this point on, is to allow yourselves to see the possibility, see uh, below the surface, and allow the other person, give that other person a space to to express that way. And mm-hmm. and this is uh, this actually totally surprised us because uh, I'm I'm an observer always of what's going on and we're looking at this and you know we're two people that probably know each other as a couple better than most couples ever could uh, and and there's times I'll look at her and I kiss her deeply in her eyes I just look at her eyes I'm going who. Are you? Are you? Mm-hmm. And I'm going, wow. I'm just, it's like, I mean, I'm getting chills just talking about this. And and we're at that stage that is way beyond the honeymoon stage for most couples. And, uh, and, and it's... Well, it, and I can you, attest from my own relationship, and I've been with my husband for 31 years, and we can still surprise each other. You know, we yes. can still like, oh, Wow. You look at you look at this particular thing from that per- wow, you yes. know, But we Celebrate. have that sense of curiosity about oh, tell me more about this, as opposed to the fear of no, 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 don't change, don't change. Stay, we have to right. keep everything you know, right where it is, where I know where everything is, because as you said earlier, uncertainty. Human beings do not like uncertainty. Tell me yes, not tell me all. no. Do not, not leave me all. out hanging here in the middle, and it's. You know, and and it's how do we help people embrace that uncertainty while, you know, it's uncertain. That's definition. It's not bad or it doesn't necessarily have to be scary. No, no. It well, uncertainty will will always invoke uh, fear because it's our in our wiring. Uh, and mm-hmm. the thing is, is to be aware of it. Say, oh, well, there's that fear of uncertainty again, and mm-hmm. uh, and then and then, but also be aware of the fact that oh yeah, but you know, it's only through the space of uncertainty that I allow the infinite possibility of the other person to express themselves, and for me to see and experience the. The, the the full spectrum of who they are, which I really do believe is limitless, and beyond mm-hmm. even who they know they who they are, and that's the beauty of having a relationship because you become uh, these these ever expanding vessels that allow each other to fully blossom within that within those respective spaces. And that's you know I hear you say that, and that is. And I've said this on this show before, and I keep coming back to it. So it's either the guests that I invite on, or it really is, I like to think it's something that has some value, is that we sort of have to be willing to grow up and take care of ourselves you know, be the one, be responsible for taking care of ourselves, not putting that on our partner to take care of us. Right. And I don't. You know, that it's how do I handle my own emotion? How do I handle my own fear? How do I handle my discomfort with uncertainty, with the idea that, yes, you might leave me. Yes, Mm -hmm. this might end. And by the way, that doesn't even necessarily mean you're going to intentionally leave me. You could die. I mean, or I could die. Anything could happen. Anything could happen. it's, It's not... 
but it's holding on, and I always think of um, that line from Star Wars where you, Princess Leia's first there and talking you know, to the Emperor, whoever she's talking to about, the, you know, the, the tighter you hold us, the more we're going to slip through your fingers. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you know, we want to hold on to our partners so tightly, but that's when they slip away. Exactly. Or we push them away. And push them away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I think, and that's why um, this context, I think, can be so valuable for people. Now, it is, it is again, I, I have to restate this. It is not, necess- it's not true. Neither is my, my, my heart is broken. But this gives them the safety net. So this gives them a way to buffer the pain that comes with the pain uh, and fear that comes with uncertainty because it is only through embracing uncertainty, the the reality of uncertainty. You know, you and I both know any perceived certainty is just illusor. You know, it's it's, it's an illusion. It's right. It's It's not going to last. Absolutely. It's not going to last. And uh, but we feel better because we think, (laughs) oh, yeah, it's a certain. Right. And then doesn't sometimes (laughs) doesn't turn out the way you want. Oh, now that goes to disappointment. And, you know, you know, we remember Mm -hmm. our Mom's telling us, "Well, don't get your hopes up because you don't want to be disappointed." And and I right. I feel like reaching back to my mom, you know, bless her heart, and say, "Mom, you know, um, it's just a feeling." <laughs> it's right. It's, it's, disappointment is actually okay. It just it's okay, <laughs> you know. And and, and that's going to happen a lot in my life, and right. and it's okay, really, mom. You know, right. and and uh, so yeah. So it's it's this um, it's this thing where you, you know if if there wasn't a way to address this because I, I do believe uh, from a societal standpoint or even to the species uh, it, 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 you know brought that out to the entire species we are mm-hmm. at this this cusp, this inflection point, where we're really truly starting to wake up, and 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 it's messy. It's just messy. Oh boy, because, is it ever! Yeah, because we're we are we are still so fundamentally affected by the drives, and and these are these are drives and and limiting beliefs that are that are ingrained in us, wired in, inside of us, both uh, genetically as well as culturally, and primarily mm-hmm. for the procreative uh, imperative. And uh, yeah, and I want and, you to hold on to that thought because okay. we're going to get there sure. in just a minute. Okay. And uh, this is happily ever. After is just the beginning on webtalkradio.net. I'm Leslie Dorries, and I'm talking today with speaker, author, and thought leader Michael Russer about what it takes to have truly fulfilling relationships and why so few of us actually do. And I hope you guys are enjoying this conversation as much as I am because I think this is just really interesting stuff and really can make a difference in your relationship. Um, so, Michael, you t- in one of your other pieces that you do, you talked about um, a six-stage developmental model of relationship, and yes. you kind of put these these stages in a context of what you were talking about this, you call it a default sexual operating model, so, and that's, yeah. based mm-hmm. on, that's based on our um, Procreative you know, evolutionary, imperative. yeah, our evolutionary procreational. Let's keep the species going. Yes, hard hardwired into us. Um, yes. That doesn't mean we have to be slaves to it, but many of us are. But so, tell me a little bit more. How does this whole concept that you're talking about make relationship success less likely? Well, yeah. If, if uh, so, if we take a look at the the six stages of a typical heteronormative relationship, um, and and by the way, these st- stages can happen in any uh, orientation because we're talking about human beings uh, right. here, and mm-hmm. it just it, it's it's a more uh, complex uh, conversation once we go outside of heteronormative, but th- it, it still applies. So you have the courtship. Uh, phase that's stage one and that's where you know that's that's where the chemistry kicks in and you Uh find find uh, two people who are mutually attracted to each other now there's all a whole that the, the term chemistry is actually quite literal uh, because the ver- our very a- body odor can make a huge difference in fact my partner the very first thing that attracted her to me was my odor 
And mm-hmm. I'm not talking about necessarily whatever I was wearing. Um, I, you know, when we make love now, we... <laughs> This is going to sound gross to some people, but we 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 will sniff each other's armpits because it is such a turn on. And so, (laughs) well, and I don't think people recognize that we still have that kind of connection. And you know, it's it is it's brain chemical. It's that kind of, for lack of a better term, animalistic attraction to each other because we're all thinking oh so and so they got a you know they got great legs or, yeah. but even that we're hardwired to pay attention to that particular part of somebody's body exactly and and a lot of it is is also culturally based as well but in this case in terms of like for example uh body aroma uh it actually has to do with uh specific sets of genes that mm-hmm. determine uh the um uh, how the immune response works within individuals and so what uh what what they think is happening they're not sure but what they think is happening is is that when uh two people find each other's uh uh, natural odor attractive it's because they're these genes um are uh programmed for different types of immune responses so that their progeny will have a broader range of immune response in other words a a greater greater chance chance of success of carrying your genes on there you go. And so that goes right back into the default sexual operating system, in which the base level of that is is the uh, is the collective survival of the species. So right, the meat may procreate time. It's what exactly. I call it. Exactly. So so every aspect of what attracts a person to another person is you peel away all the way layers of the onion. You're going to find that at some level there is that procreative imperative. Um, now there may be some uh, some uh, exceptions to that, but it, let's just put it this way: most of the attraction comes from that area. And then if it looks like it's going to be so that's stage one, the initial attraction, and that's again based on the default sexual operating system. Them. Then you go into the honeymoon period. Everybody has a honeymoon phase, and it can last from a few weeks, <laughs> notably mostly uh, by uh, celebrities, or it can last actually up to probably a couple of years, and you probably have more feedback on that than I do, but right. I, I would imagine about two years is about the maximum for most people. After that, couples tend to settle into routine, and the very definition of routine is autopilot. Uh, there's certain you're turning more and more of your 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 relationship on to autopilot, which is not necessarily a good thing. That's actually the antithesis of what we were talking about earlier, which mm-hmm. is allowing each other to first of all uh, not label each other or other or or experiences uh, collective experiences, and at the same time give the space for each other to really express and and flower and blossom with who they really are. But that isn't what happens with most relationships because they fall into routine. Then they also, at this next stage is what I call internal stressors, and that's the routine mm-hmm. dis- distraction. We live in a culture just that literally our drug of choice uh, in the 21st is distraction. century. The, the, is distraction. That is the 21st century version of Soma from Brave New World. It is used to placate the masses, and unfortunately, it uh, it also tends to stifle relationships, intimate relationships. Then we also get into gender differences. You know, during the honeymoon phase, um, you a, a couple can kind of you know accept the the differences, especially in the area of physical intimacy, uh, in terms of uh, preferences and and what one person likes versus another. But as you get into, uh, especially you get into the internal stressors of routine and distraction, gender differences start to manifest. And the gender differences is how men are wired and how women are wired. Uh, and again, primarily for, for procreative purposes, mm-hmm. men were designed to, uh, well, the moment they get hard, they're ready. And uh, and as as Robin Williams so famously said, God gave us a brain and a penis, but only enough blood to run one at a time. And right. that is so <laughs> true. And I only say that because mine doesn't work anymore that way. Mm-hmm. And boy, do I notice a difference. I my my brain is still up in my head, and uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, and it actually right, enables but for most to, but for most women, that's where 
because we only have one, we only have our brain, that that's where yeah. a lot of it starts. And, you know, and I'm so glad you mentioned gender differences because even though we're looking for egalitarian marriages or relationships, we don't stop being our individual selves and right. that seems to complicate things for people. And I think yes. that in early in the honeymoon phase, when there's a lot of attention being paid to, relation, to the relationship, there's a lot of that stimulation, not just physical stimulation for women, but emotional and mental yes. and stimulation, that, there, that physical intimacy is easier but once mm-hmm. we get into what you call the, you know, the... Well, internal stressors, yeah. The internal Gen- stressors where we get into the routine, yeah. that stops happening. And then everybody wonders why their sex life goes down the toilet. Yes, and I call them internal stressors because it's, they, these are things we actually have control over. And now we don't have control over the gender differences. We have control over how we respond to them. Mm -hmm. Um, We certainly have control over whether we turn our our relationship uh, into routine or let it fall into routine or not, and whether we allow ourselves to be distracted or not. We have control over every one of those things. Uh, But they're powerful, and it starts eroding the sense of fulfillment and intimacy uh, on all levels uh, almost immediately after the honeymoon. Mm-hmm. And uh, but you know people chalk it up. Well, that's the kind of the way it is, and you know. Well, no, that is the, that is the way it is because people go into this without being aware that this is what's happening. It is not fait accompli. Uh, that right. I can assure you. Well, and that's one of the things that makes me crazy when I hear people talk about marriage being work. It's like, no, it's not work. But people think because it's or that or that relationships are hard. It's like, no, they're they're hard because of the choices that we're making. They aren't inherently hard because in the beginning right. they're not hard. No, they're in the beginning they're not hard, and 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 uh, and, and and there's reasons for that too. But uh, but yeah, so so things you know we start settling in. Uh, and I'm going to use that term settling here again in mm-hmm. a different context. Then, uh, then we start getting into uh, external stressors. Now, these are not necessarily in a linear way. You can actually have external stressors before you, the internal stressors kick in. Any of these things can happen after the honeymoon period. So mm-hmm. stage three is the internal stressors. Stage four is the external stressors. Here you're talking about career, money, kids, health, you name it. And kids, uh, if Kids enter the picture, boy, does everything change. Wow. Yeah, they're actually the uh, worst is... thing that ever happened to relationships, but that, you know, and, and this is yes. from, the, from, from a mother of two. <laughs> yes, and I'm a father of two, and uh, it quickly turned into, and as you know from my story, I, the last 11 years of my 26-year marriage were celibate. Um, we, mm-hmm. we eliminated all intimacy. We were respectful to each other. But we effectively taught our kids how not to be intimate uh, with a, with a mm-hmm. partner, unfortunately. Absolutely. And mm-hmm. yeah, and so uh, anyway, so you get the external stressors. Kids being one of the toughest because this is uh, kids and career and money. This is what happened. This is what happened to us. And this I think I see this happen in so many other couples. What happens is is that um, is what starts what starts the cracks in a relationship are the internal stressors typically, and mm-hmm. the disappointment and the like. What what just happened? Man, it was so beautiful. Now, why is it kind of you know backing off a little bit? And so that that those are just little hairline cracks. The, the, certainly nothing fatal, but they get they become widened with the external stressors. And so here's what happens: instead of addressing what was what's already happening. What's so easy for couples to fall into, and this is a huge trap, and I'm sure you see this every time you see a couple, is that um, uh, often the, uh, the man will f- start focusing typically on his career or his buddy or his hobbies, and, uh, and the woman will start focusing typically on the family. Now, this mm-hmm. is, there are times when this is reversed, and I acknowledge that. But I'm just saying, in general, this is the, right. what happens. In other words, we start focusing on the things that, that provide a sense of fulfillment as a substitute for the loss of fulfillment that we start recognizing, even at the subconscious level, uh, that's already started happening literally right after the honeymoon phase. 
And, and, and as these stressors build, the more we tend to focus. And this is where it becomes insidious, Leslie, because both, both focuses, whether it's career, money, you know, productivity, or taking care and nurturing the kids, they're all socially sanctioned. So, yeah, Absolutely. of course. Yeah, we're yeah, in, we're but, in well, a child-centric society. Plus, also, yes, and we're also, we talked about before, this whole busy that, you know, I yes. have to be busy at my job, I have to be busy doing this, and, and it know. sucks the life right out of relationships, and people wonder, well, what happened? <laughs> so, well, exactly. And, yeah, and not only does it suck the life out of relationship, it sucks the life out of life. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the practices that my partner and I do every time we're together is just be totally present for each other. And presence is in the moment by definition. Absolutely. And so we allow mm-hmm. nothing, absolutely nothing to interfere with that. And, I'll, and if we have time, I'll give some ideas and some examples of what we do to achieve and maintain that. So then you go, so, so stage four is the external stressors. By this time, those cracks, um, uh, I've started uh, spidering and getting wider. And then it gets to a point that I call stage five, which is stagnation. Okay, you got mm-hmm. the kids, you got the mortgage, you got the career. Uh, right now, we're just doing it. We're, we're running to stay in the same place. We're, you know, it's just so we don't go backwards. And life so suddenly became very intense. Very, not suddenly, but, it, you know, it, it eased into this. Became very intense, very focused, and very unfulfilling. And yet... Uh, a lot of couples feel like, oh, you know, we'll just, we'll just work it out. We'll just keep hanging in there. But the problem is those, those, what happens, though, is those, those cracks become deep emotional wounds. And the first uh, part of the intimacy to go, which unfortunately is the very foundation of all other forms of intimacy, is the mm-hmm. emotional intimacy. Because emotional intimacy requires three things, and that is vulnerability, which is the willingness to feel everything, including the stuff that doesn't feel so good. Uh, Mm -hmm. Authenticity, which means showing up exactly who you are, uh, warts and all, and uh, without pretense, and uh, being totally authentic in your communication. And that includes saying things that need to be said, even if you feel it might hurt the feelings of the other person. And then finally, having an open heart, which simply means removing the barriers that we put up there to quote unquote protect ourselves which all it was doing was um, uh, protecting the ego. It was not the heart needs no protection. And we go back to that, you know, that right. context again. So, well, so the first thing to go ahead. It, well, and it's important to talk about that because people are always wanting the secret to, mm-hmm. you know, a healthy, happy relationship, fulfilling relationship. So I want you to repeat those three things again because they're really important and they scare yeah. the crap out of most of us. Yeah, they do. And they do because <laughs> it, it, it goes against our survival wiring. Um, mm-hmm. And, again, this is where emotional threats to our emotional well-being are, are perceived by the ego as being basically one and the, one the same as a physical threat. So they, they, it's treated as an existential threat. And that's why you get the cold sweats and all this other stuff. Uh, so, yeah, so it, the emotional intimacy, which I consider to be the absolute foundation of all, all other forms of intimacy, physical as well as spiritual, starts with uh, uh, a sense of vulnerability, which simply means a willingness on both parties to feel everything. And that is scary. But I'll tell mm-hmm. you. And as a therapist, you know this already. There is no one-way valve on feelings. Um, nope. Drugs attempt to do that, but basically all they do is create this gauzy veil uh, over life, and you feel very little of anything. And that's why we have so many anxi- anti-anxiety drugs and, and, uh, you know, uh-huh. uh, and, and uh, serotonin uptake restrictors, which, by the way, I was on at one point uh, for five years, and I, uh, I got myself off of them, and now I'm, <laughs> I'm really enjoying life. And, yeah, right, because they I, just I, flatten I feel, everything. They, they, they bring they up the lows, but they everything. also flatten the highs. So that's, yes, they, you're, they you're, to me, I was, not, I was not alive. I was numb, exactly. Okay. And so, so the willingness to feel everything, that's vulnerability. Vulnerability actually is a strength. But in our culture, especially for I men, so agree. It's, perceived, it's perceived as a weakness. And, but see, here's the thing. There's a difference between uh, physical vulnerability and, and, um, and emotional vulnerability. 
And also, there's a difference between being vulnerable and feeling vulnerable. Uh, feeling vulnerable is when you is when you feel the the fear and anxiety associated with literally an existential uh, uh, threat, and whether it's an emotion perceived emotionally or physically. Where being vulnerable, you're basically saying. I'm willing to take down all these barriers so that I feel everything and I realize it's just a feeling. It is nothing more, but it's just a feeling. And yes, I feel it, and sometimes it doesn't feel good and sometimes it feels horrible, but it's just a feeling. And so you start with that and then you go to the uh, authenticity. And authenticity is crucial. I see, so, uh, and Typically, authenticity goes out the door uh, starting with the honeymoon because there's lots of pretense going on there. Well, and absolutely, and it's, it's the idea that I have to change myself for you or you won't like me, but that's, that's the road to ending your relationship already, because yes, you, can't, you, you, you yeah. can't do that. I mean, I, I understand no. the, I, the, I don't know why I want to say that. I understand the motivation to go there because it's fear-based. But yep. then you're not being who you are, and eventually, you know, I, I tell people, the greatest actors of all time only have to be in character for a limited period of time. They're not in that character 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of their life. Right. Eventually, right. Like, if you don't talk about Yul Brenner and the King and I, but, uh, yeah. but eventually we have to be who we are, and then we get resentful because, well, you made me do this. It's like, no, you chose to do no, this. No, you chose to do it. Yeah, exactly. And so, so this is where, um, you know, this pretense, it literally does, in fact, it starts at the courtship, actually. It right. starts at the courtship. Goes, it, it, it goes into full bloom on the honeymoon, and then, um, and then the you know starts uh, the effects of that start showing up in the internal stressors, and then the external stressors, and so on. And so, uh, so uh, you know, so uh, people can choose at any time in the very moment that I no longer will live this way. I will no longer show up that way. I will show up exactly as who I am. And uh, if that is not good enough for the relationship, then so be it. But this right. is who I am. And, and I think it's uh, really important to remember that because people talk about, oh, these kinds of relationships can't exist. Well, here are two people on this call, <laughs> both in these kinds of relationships, and by the way, not with each other. <laughs> so, it's like these relationships can exist, but yes. there, it does take a certain level of willingness to be uncomfortable, to mm -hmm. commit to paying attention, as you, as you so wonderfully said, being present regularly. And yes. it's, so I mean, it, I tend to think of myself as being pretty normal. I came out of, my parents got divorced. You know, I didn't have great examples of relationships, um, and somehow I don't think I'm anything spectacular. My husband might agree, but I don't think I'm anything that great. And normal, everyday people can do this. And Absolutely. so I want to give people an opportunity to find and listen to you like I did, and where can, we, where can people find you? How can they learn more about what you're talking about so that they can become one of us? Uh, probably the easiest place to find me. I mean, I'm the uh, weekly sex and in, uh, relationship writer for the goodmenproject.com, but if uh, those come out weekly, you, they can find uh, all my audios are on my website, uh, my speaker site, uh, www, not, there's no www, it's Michael Russer Live. So Michael, M I C H A E L, Russer, R U S S E R, live, L I V E dot com. And there's a uh, audio section there. Uh, there's 52 of them up there now, on every topic you can imagine about relationship and and how to achieve the, this sort of relationship. Uh, and also, I have probably well over a hundred articles now on Goodman on Goodman Project, uh, most of which are on relationship. And it's based on the uh, the sexual operating system model. It's based on everything we're talking about here. 
Terrific. And, uh, yeah, and so I, you know, and I came to these things, uh, my partner and I came to these things in a, in a, in an environment where that, um, uh, actually uh, causes a lot of problems for most people, but I had to make a choice, uh, and uh, my full clinical impotence as a result of my prostate right. cancer, I could either choose to go into depression and victimhood, or I could choose to accept it and say, okay, now what's possible? And that, that choice, it was simply a choice. That choice opened up a world that if you had told me five years ago that this is where I would be, this is what I'd be talking about, this is... This is the kind of relationship I would have. I would say, whatever you're on, I want some because I it's got to be good. Yeah. And, yeah. and again, you know, the worst thing any person can do is, any couple can do, is put their relationship on autopilot. I have a second right. worst thing, and that's settling. You don't yeah. have to settle. But like Michael says, you have to be willing to make a different choice. And it's scary. Yeah. I get that. But... Yeah. I'm here to tell you it is absolutely worth it. And one of the things that you can do to help build yourself up and to keep, you know, move yourself towards those choices is to keep listening to the show and take action on what you hear. So until next week, stay loving.